like to call this July 10th, 2017 regular Board of Education meeting to order. With uh, a distinct honor and privilege, I ask Mr. Showalter to please take the roll. Colonel Evans? Here. Mr. Grosen? Here. Mrs. Ludwig? Here. Mr. Miko? Here. Mr. Naso? Mr. Naso is absent due to a previous commitment. Uh, number three, the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. This is the point in our uh, agenda that we re reiterate our district goals. Our three goals this year are always student achievement, financial prudence, and community engagement. Uh, I think the one that's on uh, all of our minds is financial prudence. Uh, during timely information, Superintendent Ryba will be uh, updating us again on the uh, effects of the next uh, state budget. We'll have a healthy discussion about that. Um, but it is sobering, and uh, we will have some tough decisions ahead. Uh, with that said, I uh, move on to recognition. Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Miko. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Mr. Andy Jawan, our athletic director from Strongsville High School, uh, to recognize our baseball team. Thank you. Mr. Riva, Mrs. Pelko, Mr. Showalter, and members of the school board, thank you for having me here tonight to recognize our uh, varsity baseball team as I mentioned at the last school board meeting uh, great way to end a fantastic year in athletics in Columbus this summer um, with the uh, track team competing down at the state championships and then our baseball team down in the state championship at Huntington Park um, in the OHSA division one state baseball championship as I mentioned for the track team and the same holds true for baseball it was such a great experience for these kids to play in a first-class ballpark and really to have such a, a first-class experience that the, the OHSA puts on for the baseball tournament. And as I was mentioning to Coach Sasserchi, hopefully um, it's something that our younger kids uh, can build on and, and we'll get back there again next year. Um, <clears throat> so it, also I would like to mention it was great to see all the support at the game in the stands from our community, from our uh, a lot of teachers and students made the trip down, a lot of few board members and a lot of administrators there as well. So thank you to everyone who supported our athletes in Columbus that weekend. Uh, to specifically tell us more about that weekend and the members of the team, I would like to introduce our head varsity baseball coach, Mr. Doug Sasserchi. Coach Sasserchi. Thank you, everybody. Um, I guess I'd like to start just by saying this was a special group of seniors. Um, the entire team really came together um, over the course of the season. Uh, we struggled off the, at the beginning of the season. We uh, lost our first four games, actually. We lost them against extremely good competition. And from that point forward, we went 25 and five, um, culminating in a, in a state championship uh, run. And though we came up one game short of, of winning the entire title, um, it was an unbelievable experience with a great group of kids that worked hard and truly helped our community, I guess, put Strongsville baseball back where, where, where it had been um, several years ago. Um, as I mentioned briefly, the seniors were tremendous leaders, um, both on and off the field. Um, the junior and sophomores that we had on the team um, filled in uh, admirably into whatever role that they had. And their, I guess, they followed the example of what it means to be um, a true teammate and learn. And I think those younger kids are going to develop into great leaders uh, as we move forward. Um, in the district tournament, uh, we were able to defeat Normandy and uh, St. Ignatius, uh, coming from behind to beat Ignatius in the sixth inning, scoring six runs to turn a one nothing deficit and do a six to one win. Then we went up to Perrysburg, came back from down two to nothing uh, to win our, the first of three straight games by a score of three to two uh, against Medina in the regional final, an interconference battle, and we, uh, we won that one three to two as well with the game ending with the bases loaded, two outs, a full count, and everybody moving on the bases and everybody's uh, hearts in their throat over in our dugout <laughs> and our supporter section. 
we went down to Columbus in the state semifinals and faced a kid uh, on the mound that ended up getting drafted in the 27th round of Major League Draft and is going to Vanderbilt. Well, I guess I don't know if he's going to go to school or go to, uh, go to the uh, minor leagues. Um, but he had given up 13 hits the entire season, which I didn't realize going into the game. We got six of them. Uh, Parker Shannon specifically got three of them. Um, he had a hand in all three runs and then picked a kid off in the seventh inning to win three to two and get to the final. And while we did uh, fall in this championship game uh, to Maslin Jackson, uh, losing to a team that was, I think it was 57 and three over the last two years, obviously uh, is not exactly something to be ashamed of. So it was a tremendous year. Um, and we just, it was, it was so much fun the entire time. On a personal note, I want to thank them because it was probably the most fun I had in any season of coaching, um, especially once we got our first win. Um, and, uh, and, and really just moving forward, um, kind of trying to find that balance between needing to always be, you know, serious, competitive, we want to win, but at the same time having fun um, and knowing where that line is. I think we found it more days than we didn't and the few that we didn't. Well, that's okay. We got through those as well. So, um, most of our players are here tonight. Some were not able to be, whether it was for work commitments. A couple might be actually having a summer game. Um, so I'm going to call up everybody um, and or call out everybody's name, and then those that are here um, will also step forward. Uh, first, I want to um, recognize someone who is not here. He was a left-handed pitcher. Uh, started. Um, three tournament games for us, uh, Jarrett Beachy, actually four tournament games, I guess, for us. Jarrett Beachy, left-handed pitcher. Uh, the junior who started the other three games for us, including uh, that victory in the state semifinals, Matt Broski. Come on forward. He's a junior who will return next year. There you go. Senior outfielder, Kyler Dam. Junior second baseman, and probably corner infielder going forward, Trevor Dunning. Uh, unable to be here tonight, uh, sophomore first baseman, J.D. Duplain. Unable to be here tonight, sophomore outfielder, Jack Frank. Able to be here tonight, senior outfielder and right-handed pitcher, Alex Gray. Junior left-handed pitcher, Lenny Hahn. Congratulations, thank you. Congratulations. Senior Joe Huff. Senior outfielder Zach Cushion. Sophomore outfielder, Jesse Kramer. Junior left-handed pitcher, Justin Lewis. Sophomore third baseman, Giovanni Lombardo. Sophomore outfielder, infielder, Joey Mazzarini. Junior shortstop, Mitch Medea. And also the guy who was on the mound on that 3-2 pitch in the regional final. It's a pretty big out. Uh, unable to be here tonight, junior infielder, outfielder, right-handed pitcher, Austin Mercurio. Senior right-handed pitcher, Lou Rahm. Senior catcher, Parker Shannon. Good job. Thank you. 
Uh, unable to be here tonight, junior infielder, outfielder, right-handed pitcher, John Sprague. Unable to be here tonight, manager, Joe Stewart. <laughs> Catcher, first baseman, Noah Trezino, senior. Freshman catcher, Nathan Uhas. <laughs> and sophomore outfielder, Joey Venter. The last couple of things I'd like to say is I, I would like to uh, also thank the community for whoever uh, sees this and those in attendance tonight. We really did have a lot of support and the support continued to grow um, as the tournament run went on. But that district final game against Ignatius was about as loud as I've heard our park ever. Uh, it was fantastic to have the support we did that night. Um, and it just kept going as we went to the regionals and the states, and there had to be several thousand in the stands for the state final between our fans and Jackson's. Um, also, we had um, uh, two members of our team um, get uh, all state recognition this year between uh, Parker Shannon and uh, Matt Broski uh, by Prep Baseball Report. Uh, Jared Beachy also was an honorable mention. Uh, member for them as well and who's someone who's not able to be here Jack Frank was also uh, an all-state uh, representative just I believe the only sophomore that was named to that all-state team um, by prep baseball report which is one of the top scouting services for um, Ohio as far as trying to get kids placed into college and then that's where I would like to wrap up my comments uh, all seven of our seniors um, actually all eight of our seniors, all seven players, and uh, the manager in attendance tonight will be going on to college. And a couple of them are playing ball, some are not, but all of them are ready for uh, what's ahead of them. And I think this journey really helped them and will help them as they go out on their own and into the world. So thanks to everybody. Thanks for everybody's support. And we'll see if we can do it again next year. Who knows? Coach, thanks. before you leave this, before you leave the podium, if I could, yes. just two things. Sure. Um, first of all, I have an 11 year old who plays baseball. Who knows if we'll get to you guys' league, right? Um, the thing that was touching for me is that after you guys' defeat on Jackson, the very next day was commencement. And who was there to say goodbye to his seniors? Well, it was Coach. So if I could, maybe from the players and everybody, we can have a round of applause for Coach for doing such a great job. Thank you. The second thing is, um, I want to say thank you to you as the players. Um, I was not able to make it to that game. Um, I know one of the pitchers um, at the ja on the Jackson team. And I also heard some reports from a lot of players, uh, a lot of parents, on some of the antics, let's call it that, um, from some of the other players. You guys represented Strongsville incredibly well. You represented your, not only the community, but you're great examples for our young kids who are going to play ball in the future. Also, the parents in the back rows. Um, you, got, you raised some great kids who did some amazing things. After four losses in the beginning of the season, a lot of teams would have just slumped, and these guys really did a great job. So round of, play, round of applause to the players, and thank you very much for representing our city and our school district really well. Thank you, Mr. Grosen. Once again, congratulations, Coach Lasserchi, and your assistant coaches, and boys, men, young men, I'm sorry. Uh, you just made us so proud. I was able to see you play down there, and you did a phenomenal job. Um, and parents, I, I have nine-year-old boys, and so I'm in the midst, as Ms. Pelko is, and George is, and with youth league baseball and youth league sports, and just want to thank you for y your sons didn't get here by chance. It, they got here by your support, your hard work, you're giving up your summers to go to all those travel league games. And so we appreciate everything that you've done to showcase the talent we have here in Strongsville. Seniors, best of luck to you. 
and our underclassmen that are coming back. We look forward to great things in seasons to come. So congratulations. Not many people in the state can say that they got that far. So congratulations on that significant accomplishment. At this time, this ends. Mr. Riva. Yes. Sir. One other comment. Um, yeah, congratulations to all the men, and I hope you have uh, great memories. I did read uh, Coach Sasershi's comments about uh, senior pitch or uh, high school pitchers. We appreciate that. You know, you have to have that balance between uh, wanting to win and tomorrow. So I appreciate that also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mikko. Uh, with that, that concludes recognition, and this is the time uh, to our guests. <laughs> Get out of here. Go. Leave if you can. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Have a great rest of your evening. Bye, guys. Best of luck. We'll see you next year. So while our honored guests are leaving, we can move on to public comment. I have no slips. I don't expect any slips. And I think the... Uh, I think the public uh, have all the comment they need on the fine job the uh, boys did uh, with baseball. We now come to the best part of today's agenda. No pressure, Rob. <laughs> we come to the treasurer's report. Uh, we just have one item for you tonight. It's a direct tax payment settlement agreement between the school district and the Great Escape. Um, for tax years 14 and, or 15 and 16, direct payments shall be made on or before July 24th of 17. Uh, property owners shall pay, pay a direct payment to the Board of Education in the amount of $246,840. Uh, for tax year 2017, direct payments shall be made on or before January 31st, 2018. Uh, the payment for that shall be $123,420. Uh, more details can be found in Exhibit A, and this is the item that needs to go to vote. So uh, moved. Second. Motion by uh, Mr. Grozan, second by Colonel Evans. Any discussion? No. Rob, can you at least give us a nickel encapsulation of, of what occurred for the public? Yeah, so an item like this is um, when the county goes ahead and does an appraisal for a property um, this appraisal was lower than what the sale price was when the great escape bought it from um, the bookstore that was there previously so this is to make up the difference between the first appraisal and what the actual sale price was for um, so the district is to be made whole by this so and I did want to compliment uh, Rob and uh, George's department for uh, working on this and the negotiations obviously this is not a small amount of money uh, every penny counts, uh, but uh, it's close to, uh, in one year, a quarter of a million dollars, and over the two years, it is over a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, so without any further discussion, please take the roll. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Colonel Evans? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Mikko? Yes. Motion passes. Superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Mikko. I am going to add, um, before we go into the discussion item, the Strong Schools 2020, an update on uh, the state budget. As we've shared with the board and was in the post uh, this weekend, uh, that uh, the governor did um, act on the budget. And as it shares right here, um, House Bill 49 was approved by the Ohio House and Senate on June 28th. And on the 30th, uh, the governor vetoed a section that impacts our school district, which was the Senate's plan to extend the TPP phase out over two years. So what this means and what this uh, slide shows, uh, and George showed this last time, is the Senate proposal, uh, instead of taking, uh, you could see that at the top, uh, the governor's original budget was to eliminate TPP all in fiscal year 18, about three point, a little over $3.1 million. Uh, and then the guaranteed, which is our core aid funding uh, based on our students, um, reduce that due to enrollment declines by about a half a million dollars. The House Bill 49 budget impact, as you can see in the middle of that top graph, uh, the Senate came back and said with TPP, we'll take 75% in the first year, 25% in the second year, and instead of looking at back five years for enrollment, we'll look back two years. And as you could see, that saved the district. We would still lose a little over $5.6 million in state funding 
but compared to the governor's budget, it would save the district a little over 1.4 million. So that was what was passed by the Senate. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, uh, the current governor's budget compared to his veto, he went back and vetoed the TPP uh, clause of the phase out and uh, just put it back all in fiscal year 18. He did not modify or veto the uh, Senate's um, two year look back on enrollment. Uh, so as you can see, the final decision, what was voted on or, or what was approved by the governor and signed by the governor is that we will lose all of our TPP dollars next year, which cumulative over this next two year budget is $6.2 million. And we will lose um, a little over $200,000 on our core aid for a total loss of $6.449 million. Um, and as you can see, the variance gain is because of the reduction in the core aid. Uh, that saves us $700,000 from the original proposal uh, that, was, that was put forth. So this is highly disappointing news. We talked about this a lot. Uh, we've advocated, we were down there testifying nearly at every House hearing, at every Senate hearing, um, provi providing um, some options to uh, the Senate and the House. Um, and unfortunately, uh, our governor made this comment, which I think is clear about his view on this. It says, one must also recognize that these reimbursement payments go direct, go to primarily districts with a greater ability to raise their own revenue. As a result, using state tax revenues to increase and extend these payments, divert state resources that could be used for lower wealth districts and contravenes the original intent of the law. Um, you know, the way that I look at it, and I'll send an update to the community tomorrow, uh, the, the school funding in the state of Ohio was raised $100 million. So the governor had the option to keep every school district in the state of Ohio exactly flat where, where we were in the past budget and have $100 million extra to do as he saw fit. Um, but instead, uh, he chose to veto this, use some funds to divert to other districts. And for communities like Strongsville, I think his comment is pretty clear. You have the ability to raise more local ta tax property dollars, so that's what we should do to fill the deficit. And as we just saw, comparatively, uh, that deficit over the next two years is about $6.5 million. That's a huge hole to fill. Um, and this is going by rough memory, uh, but I believe that equates to almost an eight mil levy to uh, make up just that to keep us level with where we were over the next two years. I don't know many school districts that are passing eight mil levies. Um, and so what that means for us is that uh, we will continue, as Mr. Mikko, you said at the beginning, continue to look at uh, ways we can um, still provide a premier educational experience that our kids and our community deserve, uh, deserve while uh, continuing to be financially prudent. As we've shared multiple times, we've saved the district millions and millions of dollars uh, by looking at investment opportunities as was shared uh, last meeting by reducing our staffing, by consolidating buildings, by going to self-insurance, the list goes on and on. Uh, we've reduced our five-year forecast over $10 million of what it would have been, um, but we still continue to have to sustain these cuts. So that is the final um, budget. It's been signed and that is the reality that we face moving forward. I've got a head full right now, and I think it'd be better if I just keep my mouth shut. So um, what I will uh, share, and it was uh, timely, the, there was an article uh, in this week's Cranes Cleveland Business uh, discussing uh, the effects of the state budget, and it uh, commented more, uh, the article commented on uh, how, the, how cities, how urban areas are being affected. Uh, and there was a quote from uh, our Republican, Matt Dolan, uh, our senator, uh, there's been a complete erosion over the last six years as it relates to state funding. Uh, the continuous, cut over the continuous cuts over the years leading up to this budget puts local governments in a bind. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, if misery loves company, uh, I know the, uh, the city has very similar issues. Um, we continue to do what we can uh, in, our, in our best financial <coughs> interest to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money. But a six million dollar cut over two years is not something that we can uh, conserve on expenses. It's not something that we can 
uh, simply take a look at uh, you know, copier costs or paper costs or anything else and try to save our way to $3 million a year. So this will have uh, real consequences. Um, two years ago when this happened, the legislature, uh, they didn't override the veto, but they added uh, legislation uh, later on to restore that TPP uh, replacement subsidy. Um, and we've talked about that a lot, but that, was, that, that occurred after the veto during the next legislative session. Um, so I believe our strategy or, or our, one of the things that we're going to need to do is to continue uh, pressing our story, continue pressing our uh, uh, needs for this school district with the state legislature. Um, you know, the veto was difficult. Right now, Columbus is, uh, the news is all about the Medicare uh, funding and how uh, the legislature and uh, the governor are debating that. And this becomes a uh, side story, but it will uh, we'll need to make sure it stays in the front uh, minds of our legislators uh, during the f upcoming school year. Cameron. All right, moving on. Um, I do have the going back to number one discussion item: Strong Schools 2020 re Year End Review. Uh, one of the things we've done this year is. Uh, about once a month, we've given you an update on some of the action steps that we decided as a district that would be a part of our strategic plan. And there were a few that we wanted to uh, finalize um, as we finish up the 16, 17 school year. Uh, so the first one was, a, was an action step under academic achievement and growth. And our objective was to ensure kids are college and career ready. And what we said we would do this year is establish pre-K to 12 uh, benchmarks and measurement criteria to make sure that our kids are prepared. Um, so we, this year we would finalize those criteria, we would get baseline data. Now I'm not gonna share all of it with you in this format, I'll share it with the board um, when it's completed, but I wanted to let you know that we have, it's not meant to read, uh, but we have completed that. Um, this is an example, what I've done at the bottom here is I've shown, shared with you the various tabs. So this is for our Ames web data. So what we looked at, we decided as a district, Ames Web, our diagnostic measurements, um, basically take the pulse of our kids, how are you doing in reading, how are you doing in writing and math, three times a year. Um, so we looked at uh, each of our buildings on each of these criteria, and then the bold column you could see is the average score. This is for our elementary schools. So we could see on average in kindergarten, in um, number identification, which is the very top one, um, our kids, 85% of them scored at or above national standards on that measurement, uh, and that goes down for all of the criteria. Uh, what you can see at the bottom is we looked at Next Step Guided Reading Assessment, which looks at all of our kids. Are, on, are they on grade level in terms of their reading? Uh, college Career looks at how many kids are taking college or high school classes at the middle school. It also looks at how many, what percentage of our freshmen have earned five and a half credits? What percentage of our sophomores have earned 11 credits? It takes a look at extracurricular participation. Uh, OST is the general term for Ohio State tests. We've started to receive preliminary results on those tests. Uh, they'll be finalized here soon. We'll add that when that's done. Common assessments are our local assessments that we give quarterly. And college assessments looks at for for our graduating cohort, how did we do on the SAT, ACT, and our AP exams? So uh, that has been um, completed and will give us good baseline data for how we're doing in the targeted areas uh, as we move into to the future years. And this just gives you kind of what this will be put into. In 16, 17, we'll put that average, like I said, 85%. And then what we'll decide uh, as a collaborative group is what is that target? Where do we want to get to by 2021? What is realistic? We'll set that target. And then for each of the uh, next four school years, we'll work towards that and track that same data to see uh, where we're going. So we're excited to get this uh, on the ground and baseline data and be ready to go for next year. Questions on that one? All right, the next one I'm gonna ask Dan to come up. Uh, one of the things that we looked under community engagement was the creation of a community advisory council and he's gonna talk a little bit about the work that he's led in that area. Good evening everyone. Um, as Cameron mentioned, we have um, created and implemented a new community advisory council which um, moves toward our goal of uh, community engagement. 
Uh, the purpose of the uh, Community Advisory Council is uh, to really provide feedback and ideas and insight about our district um, based on the opinions of, of our community members. Um, we want to engage them in open communication um, for the benefit of all of our students. Uh, the current focus of this uh, Community Advisory Council is um, how can we enhance our programs, offerings, and opportunities in athletics, arts, and extracurriculars to ensure a premier experience for our students. So Ms. Green has a, um, an advisory council for <coughs> curriculum. This is on the side of um, extracurriculars, athletics, and arts. Um, we have 16 members on the Community Advisory Council. Uh, they're representatives from each school in our district, so we asked each of our principals to give us uh, some names of some families who they thought might be um, uh, some, some good representation of the school and the students at the school. So we've uh, selected families um, from each, each of our schools. There's some staff rep representation um, from Strongsville City Schools. There's some youth sports representatives from the Strongsville Soccer uh, Organization and also the Strongsville Football League. We've got some arts and music representatives outside of the school district, namely the arts in Strongsville and the School of Rock. And then we have a Board of Education liaison. Uh, Mr. Nazo sits on this uh, council as well. We've met twice already in March and May. We have an upcoming meeting in August. Um, our intent is to have quarterly meetings, give or take a few, and we've uh, asked each uh, member of the committee to uh, sit on the committee for a two-year term, and then we'll, we'll refresh and uh, hopefully get some new ideas into the mix um, after this period um, of support from our community. Um, the council right now has uh, been broken up into three subcommittees to review the arts, athletics, and extracurriculars, and we're having some great <laughs> dialogue right now um, in uh, idea generation and, um, and just some great discussion uh, surrounding these, these three areas of, of student growth um, and, and getting, that in community, that getting that engagement piece from our community. So, any questions? Yes, I have a question. How can members of the community that are not on the committee give input or have some feedback? Do they contact Aaron Green or should they contact you? Or that's the great question. Um, I, I would welcome um, uh, people's uh, community members' input, and if they have ideas and, and aren't specifically on this committee, they can they can email me. Um, they can f uh, find my address on the website under the communications page. Okay, thank you. And, and for those watching at home, your email address is? <laughs> That's right. Uh, D Faust, F O U S T, at scsmustangs.org. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. And then the last one we wanted to share, um, again, with community engagement was we made a concerted effort to implement and expand our volunteer opportunities for parents to help support uh, w with during the school day uh, beyond all the other support that they give at home um, uh, for, for our schools. So I wanted to highlight a few things for our elementary and preschool. Uh, they focused on four areas. They wanted to have a consistent program, volunteer program between the elementary schools. So we designed together protocols uh, for volunteerism at those levels. Uh, we also developed um, procedures and safeguards. Obviously, parents are working with our children. They may know some confidential information. They may hear things. Uh, so there's the, what we've created was linked there. Uh, but there is, if somebody agrees to be a volunteer, there's a sign-off sheet understanding the rules and the guidelines and the expectations. Um, and then what we did is they will, each elementary generated a list of potential volunteer options. So instead of saying, hey, would you like to volunteer? Uh, what they created was a checkoff sheet. Would you like to volunteer to read to a student, to help with math facts, to work in the library, um, to do those things? Uh, so they sent those out. Um, and then each of the buildings had a set a goal to create two new volunteer opportunities uh, from which the community and parents can be involved, which each of the buildings did this year. So it was good to get uh, that solidified. And, and um, some buildings had more success than others uh, in, in getting parents to be involved, um, but at least we've got a good foundation moving forward. 
For the middle school, they had a variety of things, but one of the things that they did that I thought was really neat and well attended is they started a career cafe. So each quarter, they, they worked with uh, a parent or a community member that had a career that may have been of interest to middle school kids, and they would be there during the lunch period. So instead of eating lunch in the commons, they would go eat lunch in a separate room. Um, the presenter would share their job, what they do, the kids could ask questions, and uh, it was just a great opportunity and very well attended by uh, our middle school uh, students. And at the high school level, Dan worked collaboratively with the high school staff uh, and Mr. Smithberger. They wanted to create a community database and partnerships uh, that could be used for the whole district. So that's pretty much finalized now. Um, they've gone through and they've looked at here are the communities or the community businesses that are available, that are interested, they want to work, they want to partner with the schools, and then there's criteria whether they want to possibly have a senior project, to have an internship opportunity, come to a career fair. Um, so we've got that database that everybody can use in the school district and look at and say, hey, I need somebody to come um, talk about Subject X, here's a company in the, in the community that would like to do that, and here's the contact information. Um, and the high school also held for the first time a job fair. Uh, that was one of the goals of their volunteer plan. They held that this spring, and uh, it was exciting for our kids to get the opportunity to interview, not only interview, but many of them were offered jobs on the spot. Uh, and so that was a great um, first event for them, and uh, sure, it's going to become a part of an annual or semi-annual routine for the high school. So. That's the work we did on um, bringing businesses in or at the elementary level having volunteers coming in to help support. So what we did is we've, uh, and I'll share this comprehensively with the board at our retreat in August, uh, but what we did is you could see at the bottom is the criteria. You know, some of these action steps are clearly measurable. Um, some of them uh, are a little more uh, uh, qualitative rather than quantitative. So we created this scale to say, if we completed it or completed it and it sustained, we gave ourselves a 100% rating. If we made significant progress, 85%, satisfactory, 70%, and limited to no progress, 50%. So we did this for every action step, and that's what I'll share with you uh, at the retreat of where we were at. Um, and then what we did is an average uh, for all the action steps. So as you could see, uh, for each of the three goals that we had, you go down to the key, it would rate around significant progress towards uh, each of those goals that we had. Um, and then we can get into the weeds at the retreat and share um, where we had greater success and where there's some areas of improvement. And as I've shared with the board previously, when it's all finalized, we'll transition it into an infographic or a dashboard type look to be able to say by objective, where were we in attaining uh, our goal? And that's the... Uh, update on the Strong Schools 2020 plan unless there's questions. Questions? Anyone? Okay. So I will just highlight, we, we spent a lot of time on community engagement, but a lot of the action plans and a lot of the things we've discussed throughout the year uh, for our 2020 plan, the goal being that uh, we become a premier school district, uh, our funding becomes a, uh, a key uh, problem that we will need to solve. A lot of the things we've talked about right. uh, come down to funding for it um, and, and being able to you know, pay for the kind of changes we want to make in the school district to be that premier school district, whether it be our, uh, our principal program mm -hmm. or those other programs. Those are on hold because of our tenuous uh, finance situation. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Micko. And finally, the last item is the administrative handbook revision. Uh, be resolved that uh, the administrative handbook from August 1st, 2016 and July 31st, 2019 be revised and the Board of Education approves the updated version. Um, as previously shared, uh, these are all just title changes. Uh, we've added operations manager um, to business manager. We're changing Andy Trujillo's title from Director of Special Education to Student Services because his role is really truly all-encompassing now. Um, later on in the agenda, we have for your consideration the, uh, uh, the a title change to a high school associate principal position, and um, we have eliminated the preschool director position, so that has been eliminated. And anywhere those titles appeared in the handbook, those have been changed accordingly. Um, so that is up on the consent calendar for your consideration um, and that ends my timely information report unless there's questions 
All right, moving on to business services. Uh, as an annual approval item, it is uh, the schedule of rental fees for direct and indirect costs, which can be found in Exhibit B. Uh, just to highlight, we have not changed the rates. There's been two changes that have made on this. First of all, auxiliary gyms previously only said high school. The middle school, the back gym is considered an auxiliary gym, um, so we did add that. Uh, and then based on our work with, uh, we've had a, a handful of Ohio High School Athletic Association soccer contests at Pakatan Stadium. We held them this past fall. We would like to continue to do that. Uh, the going rate within OHSAA is a flat fee of $500 to rent it. Uh, so for our athletic fields at the high school, the asterisk notes that we would waive the $150 an hour fee only for OHSAA soccer contest to be a flat fee of $500. Um, and so that is up for your consideration. Excuse me, Cameron. Sure. Would that include nighttime contests? Yes, it would. So 500 bucks, regardless of whether they use the lights or not, that seems like we should be charging more if it's at night. Right, it, but what we're competing against is other school districts that are providing that same service for $500. So what it does for us is it does produce revenue for the athletic department um, for holding those tournaments. So it's, it's financially viable for us as well um, to, to have those and the rental fees are what they're getting anywhere else. What do we else. net out? Rob, I, George, there's a budget line item for that, Rob. It, I don't know if you know offhand. It depends on the tournament. Um, really, football is, is a good draw. Um, the playoff games that we hosted this year yeah, in the fall. We're talking about soccer only, right? Soccer only, yeah. bucks. Uh, boys or girls, um, it same. doesn't matter. It, most of the money gets sent back to the um, OHSAA at the end, but it's the money that you can make from concessions for the boosters while, you, while they're here. Um, also for any game workers uh, that want to help out, they get paid f um, from the till as well, from the income for that. Um, so the $500 for soccer is it just a flat fee. It's set by OHSAA. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that anywhere they go in the state, that's what they would pay to rent the fields for an OHSAA tournament game for soccer. And my only comment, too, is our stadium is a sunk cost. Uh, the electricity to keep the lights on is probably your only variable at that point. Um, and I wouldn't think that it would be more than the $500. So. Well, we do have a difference for field sure. with lights. Don't Correct. You? Yes, we do. And what's the difference again? Uh, we have, uh, it's an additional, it's double. It's $150 an hour or $300 an hour with lights. Yeah, that's my point. So, you know, because they, if like, concessions might be great if we get to keep all that, but we don't. So, and with the financial situation that Richard outlined, we may need to get sick here. And our field is nicer than a lot of people. They want to go to a crappier field, fine. You know, but if they want to use the nice field, then they should pay for it. So I'm not sure that 500 bucks is adequate. Yeah, that, and I understand, Colonel Evans, that's the, uh, they, they, because we had this approved, uh, they paid the rate, the $150, they must have had it, I can't remember whether it was during the day or night, but they paid the rental rate that was approved, but they did share that they would not be, they did that because they were stuck. They had a cancellation and they came to our field and we helped them out and they paid the higher rate. Um, but what was shared is that you know, it, they won't use our field in the future as frequently if it's if it's not the five hundred dollar rate. So that's a choice that the, the board needs to make. Okay. But those are the only two changes. All the other hourly rates stay the same. Number two is gifts. Uh, Carol Jankura donated miscellaneous preschool toys and books valued at approximately one hundred fifty dollars to the Strongsville Early Learning Preschool. And the VFW Post 3345 donated a new American flag to the Strongsville Middle School. And that concludes business services, unless there's any comments or questions. Moving on to C, curriculum. We have an overnight trip for the high school girls' uh, tennis team to travel to Mason, Ohio for match play and to attend a professional tennis tournament August 11th through 13th. The expenses associated will be paid by the participating students. That concludes curriculum, unless there's questions. Moving on to student services, uh, we have education alternative service agreement uh, that the Board of Education enters into a tuition excess cost agreement with Ed Alternatives for the placement of students with disabilities for the 17-18 school year, which can found, be found in Exhibit C. And on item two for the STEPS Academy, uh, that the Board of Education enters into agreement with the STEPS Academy in the amount of $70,000 
for the placement of students with disabilities for the 17-18 school year, which can be found in Exhibit D. And unless there's questions, that concludes the Student Services Report. Next, with the Human Resource Report, we have Assistant Superintendent Jenny Puckle. Thank you, Mr. Ryba. Good evening, everyone. Under Human Resources, I have the following items for your consideration this evening. Under E1, we have uh, the reduction in force of two assistant principal high school positions. Under E2, uh, we have the resignation of one of our family's consumer science teachers, resignation of a non-certificated staff member, and a resignation for a certificated supplemental position. Under E3, we have the following appointments uh, for certificated staff and one appointment for a non-certificated substitute and two certificated supplemental contracts and one certificated supplemental contract that is prorated. Under E4, we have a few changes in status for non-certificated staff members. Under E5, we have the change in title uh, that Mr. Ryba referred to uh, for Brian Tamino from assistant principal to high school associate principal for next year. Under E6, we have a change in a full-time equivalent certificated staff from a .8 full-time to a, to a full-time teacher. Under E7, we have the following stipends for our extended school year program and stipends for our non-certificated staff member and continued under E7, stipends for non-certificated staff members for our auditorium stage and lighting crew. I do need to make one change. Uh, we just got this uh, change. Um, I would like to pull Jimmy Avery's name from this uh, list. He resigned the, his position. Under E8, we have the continuing contract recommendation for a non-certificated staff member. Under E9, I have medical leaves for certificated, uh, one certificated staff member and medical leaves for non-certificated staff members. Under E10, we have the service agreement uh, for um, our PSI auxiliary services. Uh, and this is to provide uh, remedial enrichment intervention services for St. Joseph and John in a parochial school under the auxiliary funding administered to approved non-public school uh, by local districts. And under E11, we have the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, be it resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent that the Memorandum of Understanding between the Strongsville Board of Education and the Ohio Association of Public School Employees, Local 028, as stated in the exhibit, and that can be found under Exhibit F. And that concludes my report, unless there are any questions for me. Jenny, can you, um, I want to make sure the public understands the board. We've discussed it quite a bit at length, but I want to make sure the public understands, you know, we are reducing two assistant principals, which probably says, oh my gosh, we're reducing two assistant principals. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, Brian that's becoming um, Assist associate principal. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to explain what that's about and how it uh, how it will benefit not just our academic or our student achievement, but it'll also uh, benefit our financial prudence. Sure. So uh, the first position um, that we um, reduced was Steve Breckner's position at the high school. So uh, who will now become our operations manager? Uh, and due to the enrollment at the high school that we felt at this time is, is appropriate. Uh, Brian will be now become the associate principal for the high school, so that's the second assistant position. And Brian's focus will be um, more on the curricular side of things. Uh, so he will be uh, in charge of m the core departments, so math, language, arts, science, social studies, where he will directly oversee them. Um, he will be meeting with teachers, working with them on a lot of the things that I mentioned earlier in this year that goes along with our academic plan, our instructional plan, uh, and he will be in charge of really overseeing that. He'll also be um, doing a lot of the teacher evaluations as well uh, and working directly with uh, Mr. Smithberger on those initiatives as well as uh, Ms. Green in the curriculum office to give the support that's necessary to the high school in regards to curriculum. And one of the things to continue on, Mr. Micko, is as Jenny said, uh, there's kind of a ratio that we use for students to assistant principals. And based on the enrollment at the high school, we are at that uh, ratio where uh, four were no longer necessary and three were sufficient. Um, based on these administrative changes and some others throughout the school year, we've reduced our administrative costs by over $140,000. 
which I think is significant as we also look, we're not just looking for uh, one employee group to uh, burden some of the reductions we have, but we're always looking through all of our employee groups administratively as well. Um, and these moves, which will help us still be as efficient, um, I, I feel they'll help us be more efficient in the, in the work and the way that we're utilizing our personnel, but also um, will save significant dollars in administrative costs moving into uh, fiscal year 18. Thank you, Cameron. The thing I want to highlight is, is that Brian's position is becoming a year-round position, Correct. Correct. Um, which will allow us to concentrate. Um, you know, we need that level of focus mm -hmm. on what we teach at the high school level. Um, you know, if we want to move to the next step, we need to have that increased focus. And in the past, we would have four uh, ass assistant principals, and they were generally they took care of one grade mm -hmm. you know freshman through senior grade and now the focus is going to be much more on uh, Brian's position as you know looking across the high school experience mm -hmm. looking across what do we expect uh, a freshman to accomplish and get ready for so that uh, they're successful their senior year and then uh, because of the declining enrollment I think it's reasonable that we'll have two uh, traditional associate principals that'll just deal with the, uh, I guess, the more day-to-day uh, -day or year-to-year -year issues that parents and students have. So I need to want to compliment you. It's a good job, and it doesn't hurt that we're saving $140,000. Are there any other questions or comments? There's no items under technology for this uh, oh, month? Oh, yes, there is. Hmm. We have to remind everyone that uh, the maker, uh, the maker uh, space, space opportunity is in August for grades three through five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish I was in grades three through five, mm -hmm. but I think I'm going to figure out a way to attend anyways. Hmm. And then that concludes my report, Mr. McCall. So uh, we are now on to item nine, the consent calendar. We're going to highlight that section 8E7. Uh, Jimmy Avery is not on the consent calendar. He uh, resigned the position. Uh, all uh, action by the Board of Education and adoption of this consent calendar at this point of the agenda means all items appearing in this agenda with ad asterisks are adopted with one single motion. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Motion by Colonel Evans, second by Mrs. Ludwig. Any discussion? Mr. Showalter. Colonel Evans? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Grozen? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Motion passes. Number 10, uh, second reading board bylaws and policies. I'm not going to read all of them are, that are listed. Uh, we will have our third reading at our next board meeting uh, and we'll uh, make sure to get any uh, modifications or addendums to the board. Uh, we discussed uh, a few at the last board meeting. Um, so we'll have our final version uh, ready by the next board meeting. And now on to uh, number 11, Board of Education Other. I'll turn it back over to you, Cameron. Uh, well, Mr. Naso and I spoke and he asked that uh, I put on the agenda um, because it is one of our policies that's up for review, which is policy 5111, which is the eligibility of resident, non-resident students. Uh, a few months ago, Vicki Turner uh, shared her research on open enrollment, and we learned that there are three um, opportunities there, uh, boundering districts, any district, or not technically open enrollment, but the ability of a school district to allow uh, the children of staff members that may not live in the city to attend tuition-free. Uh, policy 5111 uh, has that stipulation in it, and based on some discussions there was the the question for the board to discuss under this item is should you wish to consider um, adding that stipulation uh, through this policy review that staff members children can uh, attend school tuition free that would be something that we could do during this policy uh, process prior to the third reading um, so what i would like the board to i'll give you some options and then it would be open for discussion when we talk about um, the children of staff members attending uh, tuition free, as Vicki shared, remember we get, you know, 563 bucks from the state for each kid, a little more depending on uh, what categories they may fall into. But if a child from another school district comes to us, 
they bring with them the $6,020 of uh, state funding. Um, if we don't have to add any staff uh, to support that, that is, you know, let's just say a $5,000 or $6,000 uh, revenue generator for the district, um, as well as a positive for our staff members to be invested in the, in the school district by having their kids attend. Um, when you consider uh, allowing staff members, students to attend, there's two things that uh, I would encourage the board to think about. Um, number one is uh, that they could, when they, you go by the registration date. So that means that if we would say, okay, staff members, kids, you're allowed to attend our district, they would register, they would select the school that they would like to attend if it's an elementary school, um, and then based on their registration date, they would get priority. Um, as to whether there was an open section. Uh, like Ms. Pelko, what she's dealing with right now is our class cap guidelines are 25 K to three. So there's some sections where we've reached that class cap and we've got kids on the waiting list to see. And if not, uh, as we've done in the years past, there's a handful of students that we have to send to different schools because there's no more room at one school. So one option is just to go by student registration date and those students would be placed at that time. Um, the other option, and it's the option that if the board wants to move forward with this that I would recommend, is that we follow similar or procedures that we have in place uh, for intra-district out-of-boundary requests. So just as a refresher, if I'm, I'll use Mr. Micko as I know he lives in the Moraski area. If his children are to attend Moraski, but say they want to go to Kinsner, he can fill out an application. It's due no later than July 10th. And by July 31st, I as superintendent have to make the decision of can they attend the school that they wish. Once they are placed at that school, they're permanently placed at that school. Um, I feel most comfortable if we are gonna begin to allow um, staff members' children to attend the school district, that we follow the same procedure, that they would submit their request in writing. Uh, we would not make that uh, decision until that July 1st deadline, um, uh, that way, Parents that move in throughout the summer, that live in the city, that may live in a neighborhood school would have first opportunity. And if there was open spots in the grade levels requested uh, and it wouldn't cause increases staffing, um, then those children could uh, attend. This, the third thing to keep note of is that this would be an annual process. So open enrollment processes doesn't mean once you're in, you're in forever. Uh, it's annually done. Um, and I would recommend if that's annually done in this instance where uh, every year there would be a new application, every year we would determine whether there was room without increasing costs that the students could attend tuition free. So that's kind of the logistics of it. Um, action by board policy would, was what would be needed in August to make this happen. And then I'll turn it over to Mr. Micko um, for any discussion from the board. So I open it up to discussion. Yeah, clarify for me, Cameron, the difference between the 562 and the 6020. Um, we get, so the, the state funding formula says every, it's, it's, it's 6,000 now, but it'll go up to $6,020. What the state has, it has a state share index, which is a multiplier, it's what, 9.4% or somewhere around there for us, that the state says because Strongsville is considered a high wealth district, we take 9.4% of $6,000, and that's what we're gonna give you per student. So um, that's really what we get uh, for each child. There's, if, you're, if you're a child that uh, is classified as economically disadvantaged, or you have a disability, or you're an English language learner, there's additional funds that are added to that. So um, the average dollars we get from the state per student, I think is a little above 1,000 bucks or something like 1200 bucks somewhere in that range but just a, a straight funding formula it's 563 dollars but if that child comes from a neighboring district we would get the entire six thousand twenty dollars for that child mm -hmm. and it's the same reason colonel levens if the reason we've saved so much money with our online school is because we have less students taking that six thousand dollars to go to ecot or odella um, and I think I'll save uh, George's uh, thunder uh, till when he gets back, but we've even seen greater savings, significant savings in that area, and that's because we're holding on to that full $6,000 um, because they're staying strong as well as good city school students. 
So, but there is a limit to that because that's saving money that we used to have to uh, have <coughs> deducted. So conceivably, if every student that went to a online charter school or any charter school came back, we would simply stop mm -hmm. sending that money in. It's not as if, um, when we say save, it's uh, we're cutting the money we send back. So Correct. there is a limit to that. I, I mean, I don't have a problem, and I encourage the idea that our staff that the people who work here on a daily basis, who make our schools what they are, have the opportunity to provide their children um, and have them come into our doors. Um, my f fundamental reason for sitting in front of this camera and this desk is for the kids. Um, if those parents and those people who spend their days here, make their livings here, make their retirement here, um, have skin in the game. And for those individuals who work within these walls and in our other buildings, if they choose to bring their children um, here, um, that's a vote of confidence for me that you know we provide a great education, we provide a system that is uh, of the best benefit to our to those children. Um, I'm not in favor of open enrollment, and I've made that very clear. Um, if you want to come and go to school in Strongsville, then buy a house in Strongsville. Um, I believe that this is somewhere right in the middle um, because I'm not going to have our schools being overcrowded with children from surrounding communities, and some of them good athletes, some of them not good athletes. Um, if you want to come to our district, then buy a house. Make the investment to come here. Um, but we're talking about our employees. So for me, um, I... I Again, I, my focus is the children and the parents who have to drive here and who make our district um, and are driving to make our district a premier district. So I don't, for me, I don't have an issue. Um, I do want to not call it open enrollment, though. Uh, I want to call it employee enrollment um, because I think we're sending the wrong message. Um, but that's just my opinion of it. Good. Well, I'm against it. I'm sorry. People that the taxpayers moved to Strongsville to be students here, and that's who we're beholden to is the people that do live here. So. So, and I'll. Do you have another comment, Colonel? I I think there's a lot more to this, and I'd like to see more details on it. You know, the funding and all that stuff, and and particularly Cameron, you outlined about you know uh, the holy hand grenade there, counting to three on three mm -hmm. different ways of bringing. The kids in here i agree with george on the idea that the people that are our teachers and our staff that make our district what it's going to be if they have their kids in here they have even more skin in the game and it seems to me that would be a good thing to allow so uh, at this juncture i would lean towards supporting it so i'm uh i'm going to use george's words um, i think you should be a taxpayer um, to go to school here so um all the, all the things that we've talked about about uh, our employees are all valid and our employees, um, I think Strongsville is a great place to live and if our employees want to send their kids to Strongsville City Schools, um, there's no limit uh, or there's no shortage of realtors who would help them find a home to live here. Um, so I am against it. Um, I did talk with Carl um, who brought the idea up. Um, so at this juncture, I think I'm comfortable uh, with the uh, agreement to the rest of the board um, let's define what this would be more uh, what we would be looking at um, and send it as a board update uh, my concerns are uh, if we and again being uh, being against it my concerns are some of the uh, some of the mechanics you know we do have a uh, we have employees that are part-time uh, what level of employment do you have to have um, for this benefit because it is a benefit um, I do think the uh, increased funding, um, Columbus has a funny way of uh, changing um, how funding works, and I, um, I think it's a bit of a Pandora's box. Um, right now, it's to our benefit. Um, they want to take us off the cap. They want to take us off the guarantee, at which point all of those numbers uh, start to change. Um, uh, 
I guess my last comment is, is I've never had a parent call me and say there aren't enough children in my child's classroom. What can we do about it? Um, I never had that call once uh, that, you know, there's, you know, we need more kids in my child's classroom. I've had a number of uh, calls. Mr. Vecco, I don't think you'd ever would get that phone call. Uh, we've had a number of Thank calls. You. We've had a number of calls. Uh, we always have uh, that are, you know, what can we do to have smaller class sizes? Um, but unless anyone disagrees, I just think uh, we'll move on with uh, Cameron uh, putting some more structure, uh, getting some more ideas on, on what the actual funding benefits would be. Um, and then we can uh, follow up with a decision. Um, I'm also, I also will say out loud, we don't have to make the decision now. We can continue to, to research it, we continue to discuss it, and then perhaps make that decision for next, not this current school year, but so we'll the put school this year on, after. So we'll put this, we'll put yes. this on the agenda for let's, next board meeting? Let's put 5111 on hold for now and not go forward with it until we get the, the information that we want to. Yeah, and I can, I can share with the board, you, you know, what I could do is share with you a specific plan about how this would work instead of options. Here's what I would recommend if we're gonna do this as a specific plan. Um, for the 5111, you know, that's where at the August 3rd meeting, that's where it's gonna be the vote on the policy. So that's something we can separate out or uh, keep in and, and, and address, um, but that's where the board will have to take action on what we're going to do is when we officially vote on that policy because it's either going to be stricken like it currently is uh, or it would be put back in um, so i will be able to uh, get the board that updated information here shortly okay any other comments any other others i have one um everybody knows that i like to um, speak my mind so i'll be very frank on my opinion about something. Um, unfortunately, two weeks ago, I was not able to attend my Friday morning rotary meetings. And unfortunately, um, the new Albert Einstein um, Charter School, who's gonna be moving into Drake, had an opportunity to come in and speak to our, our group. Um, wasn't happy about that at all. But it's a free market, obviously. So I think I th it's important that the parents and the public of this community understand, and having children there in the school age, um, I received a postcard from that business. Um, I'm very proud to say that Strongsville City Schools earned high marks from the state, um, A's and B's, where the Albert Einstein data, um, you're looking at performance index C, Indicators met grade 2015, F. Overall value added grade 2015, D. High mobile value added, B. AMO grade 2015, C. There's numbers of Fs, Cs, and Ds. So as a parent, if you're going to make a choice, please educate yourself on what educational facility place you're gonna place your children. And I think it's important that those state indicators are something that re are reviewed by children, by parents. Thank you. Any other others? So my final other is a reminder to parents, uh, there is a sales tax holiday again this year. The holiday starts on Friday, August 4th at 12 a.m. and ends on Saturday, August 6th at 11.59 p.m. During that sales tax holiday, Clothing priced at $75 per item or less. School supplies priced at $20 per item or less. And school instructional material priced at $20 per item or less is sales tax free. Um, so it's a, it, uh, it always is set to coincide with going back to school. Um, sales tax in Cuyahoga County is 8%. It's not uh, insubstantial. And that uh, whether it's the $75 or the $20, that's not your limit. That's your per item limit. You can buy as many of those items as you want. And if any of you have the uh, challenge of telling your children that we're not buying those expensive clothes, you now have a way to say $75 or less per item. And that concludes my other meeting notifications. Uh, regular Board of Education meeting work session will be held Thursday, August 3rd at 7 p.m. in the meeting room of the administration building, which is where we are now. 
A special Board of Education meeting retreat will be held Monday, August 7th at 6.30 p.m. in the same facility. Um, obviously, uh, we don't need to reiterate again uh, the effect that the budget will have, but I'm certain it will be an uh, important topic for our retreat. And then we have our regular business meeting on Thursday, August 17th at 7 p.m. once again in this building. We do have need for executive session under the topic of preparing, discussing, et cetera, negotiations. And are yes, there any have, others? Yep, to consider the compensation of a public employee or official and to review negotiations or bargaining sessions uh, with public employees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Motion by Colonel Evans, second by Mrs. Ludwig. Mr. Showalter. Colonel Evans? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Grozen? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. We will go into executive session at 8.15. I would like to compliment Rob on the fine job he did today. Thank you. Uh, we'll let George pretend it was all his training, but we know it was independent study. Uh, we have no other business after executive session. Have a great summer, and we'll see you in August.